our election process is very unique. The election really for the president is going to come down to a handful of states. And if crypto is important in those states, they crypto natives can swing the election. Um, that's just how it is. It's June 18th, 2024, and this is Markets Daily, a show where we get into the minds of some of the most experienced CEOs, analysts, researchers, academics, strategists, and anyone with a hot or smart take on the crypto markets. Before we get into today's discussion, let's take a look at what's going on in the markets. Crypto majors slid further during the European morning with some of the predominant altcoins and meme coins leading the plunge. Sol and Doge were among the worst affected, currently trading around four and a half and 10% lower in the last 24 hours. Bitcoin retreated after a short-lived bounce and is now sitting around $65,100. Ether is down almost 4%. DJT, a crypto token minted two months ago on Solana, rallied as much as 180% yesterday on an unconfirmed report that former President Trump is behind it. And AI-related coins slid as Google search queries show peak retail investor interest. Top coins supposedly associated with AI have dropped over 20% in seven days. Joining the show now to dive deeper into the crypto markets this morning is Chris Perkins, Coin Fund President. Welcome. Hey, Jen. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you again. We haven't spoken in a little while, so I'm excited to hear your thoughts on what's going on. What are you watching in the markets this morning? Yeah, thanks for having me on again. And uh, I think from a from a general perspective, we're seeing some weakness in the crypto markets, um, but we're still believe that we're in a bull regime. Uh, this can be expected. And, and I think a lot of of this impact, this negative impact on markets is really a function of some near term macro inputs. And so, you know, there's a general sense now that the Fed may stay higher for longer, but we're really not talking about raising rates at this point. And in fact, you know, maybe we'll have one rate cut. Um, but but it's this near term higher for longer impact that's been having maybe a negative impact on, on some of the obviously Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin stayed a bit more resilient than some of the, the altcoins. Um, and, and despite this near-term macro pressure, we're still very excited about the setup that we have. And really, if you step back and you think through a little bit more of a long-term perspective, we're seeing some very, very positive things happening from the top down. So for example, we're seeing a, a real material amount of regulatory de-risking. I mean, look what we've just gone through. We saw the Congress vote on a bipartisan basis to repeal the dreaded SAB 121, which made it very punitive for, um, for, for custodians to hold crypto. We also saw bipartisan support, 71 Democrats joined um, the Republicans' counterparts to vote for FIT 21. Now, look, that, that bill is probably not gonna pass. And yes, SAB 121 was, was, was vetoed, but you're seeing this groundswell of bipartisan support, which is really leading to regulatory de-risking which I think in the longer term is a much bigger unlock. Of course, that culminated with the approval of the 19B4s for the ETH ETF, which I think is going to be also very bullish as people start saying, wow, um, what's this thing called ETH? Oh my gosh, it has stable supply, just like, just like Bitcoin. Wow, it has utility because I need to use it to pay for gas. And wow, it has yield. But wait a second, I can't get that yield through the ETF. How do I go about you know, learning about this thing called crypto so I can get that that real yield, which I think is super exciting. Finally, we're seeing, you know, really strong bottoms up things happening with projects. You know, I'm very gifted and I'm, not gifted, I'm very lucky because I get to see these very gifted founders every single day and the things that they're building and the value that they're creating. Um, and so whether it's, you know, all the building we're seeing on things like the Ton ecosystem, where Telegram has 900 million users and there's a blockchain that, that supports it called Ton. Um, very exciting things happening there. Uh, or yesterday, we saw um, Robert Leshner and, and Superstate announcing that they're using their tokenized uh, collateral, their tokenized money market fund for collateral. This is a major, major unlock that I don't think people are recognizing. So long, ter long term, we remain very bullish. Uh, we're going to navigate this macro noise. Um, but yeah, feeling, feeling very good. 
I want to talk about some of the points you just brought up. But first, I have to ask you about something I just talked about in my introduction here. This DJT token, it is the talk of the town. People think that former President Donald Trump could be behind it. That has not been confirmed. But there's really been this kind of resurgence of polyfy tokens, if you will. And and you brought it up a little bit there when you were talking about the regulatory clarity that we are seemingly getting in the United States. Um, crypto and politics are really becoming a conversation that is pertinent ahead of the elections coming up in November. What do you make of this token? What do you make about the convergence of politics and crypto that we're seeing? It feels like something we haven't seen before. Technology is not political. It's just technology. But when you're running into razor thin election margins, everything becomes political. And I think the light bulb has finally gone on on both sides of the aisle. And, you know, DCG put out a really interesting report that talked about how voters in swing states and, and like, remember, our election process is very unique. The election really for the president is going to come down to a handful of states. And if crypto is important in those states, they crypto natives can swing the election. Um, that's just how it is. And so we're seeing, um, I think, what we've hoped for all along in that both sides of the aisle are saying, well, wait a second, we need to pay attention to this because from an American perspective, we've always prided ourselves in innovation and, and lead, leadership in technology. And it's simply un-American to look backwards and to try to suppress these things. So um, whether, and I, I talked about the bipartisan support that we're seeing, um, the, the prediction markets are, are fascinating. I mean, look what's going on with Polymarket. You know, President Trump, I'm told, looks at it almost every single day to see how he's polling because, you know, that's how people are discovering truth. Um, look, I, I think it's great that it's that it's an important part of the political discussion right now. I think it's great that both sides are coming around. Um, look, even yesterday, Paul Ryan published a piece on how important stable coins are for the future of America. Amen to that. It's about time um, that, that people are realizing how important it is. Um, and, and let's not forget that we've seen Senator Schumer, we've seen Senator Booker, Nancy Pelosi, all voting in, in favor of political policy. This is nothing but a very good thing for the long term future of our industry. Let's go back to that ETH ETF. Um, the Bitcoin ETF approved in January. We saw a lot of positive market reaction. Some of the folks I've spoken to recently have said, maybe we're not going to see the same thing when the ETH ETF hits the market. What do you think? Again, we think through a long-term lens, and I think that the Ethereum ETF is just a, a great unlock. Um, are we going to see inflows? Absolutely, we're going to see inflows. Are, are, how long is it going to take? Well, look, a lot of the the... the the wealth in this country is controlled by the boomers and they um as that as that wealth migrates into you know other generations you're going to see more adoption this is going to be a long term trend as the ETH ETF builds but there's some issues with the ETF out of the gate um and and one of those issues is that market participants are not going to be able to avail themselves of one of the most exciting parts of ethereum and that's its yield uh, you know, we track the yield via an index called Caesar, um, which, which, which captures that that ETH yield. Um, it's a pretty it's a pretty nice yield, actually. It, it, from a real yield perspective, it outperforms Treasuries. And so, my thesis is that yes, it's going to draw a new a new um, set, a new generation of folks to crypto. They're going to look at this thing called ETH, and they're going to say, "Well, wait a second. This is actually a gateway into things such as DeFi. What else is out there?" And I think there's a lot of folks who got their start in, e in Ethereum, and it really, they, they, they took that, they, they opened up a wallet, and then they started navigating and really learning about the power of smart contracts. So again, very, very bullish for the long-term outlook for our industry. What do you think needs to happen for folks to have that intrigue, that interest, and then start to educate themselves on the different features of Ethereum? Because the ETF is one thing, but really diving into the Ethereum ecosystem is a different thing. And a lot of the people I've talked to on the show have kind of separated out the two different audiences. The person who might, uh, or, or the entity who might dabble in the ETH ETF wouldn't really interact with the Ethereum ecosystem. It sounds like you see the ETF as being a gateway drug into the Ethereum ecosystem and see people kind of uh, being more open to decentralization through the ETF. Yeah, it's it's a great point. I do. I, I think it's a gateway drug. But let's talk about how ironic this is. 
you know, we've spent countless, like countless hours trying to convince people that Ethereum is a commodity and it looks like it is. But then we do is we advocate, we say, no, 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 let's turn it into a security so that people can trade it, which is what the ETF is. So it's, there's a, there's a ton of irony around that, but why are we doing that? Two things. It delivers regulatory certainty and it also delivers operational scalability. So anyone can just go on their phone on their brokerage account, just press a button and not have to worry about it, right? But again, it's it's not the perfect product because you can't achieve that yield. And so my sense is that, you know, as this we were continuing to see this regulatory de-risking and, you know, the amount of infrastructure that's being built, like Coinbase just released its smart wallet. It's it's pretty awesome. But you're going to start seeing a better and better user experience. And so that operational scalability and that user experience is going to improve. Obviously, you know, if you're investing some in something and you research it, like I said, one of the most exciting things about Ethereum, besides and it's got three things, stable supply, utility and yield. Well, well, in order to understand that utility and access that yield, you're probably going to need to get into the native space. So I think it's a gateway. I want to talk a little bit about Coin Fund's investment thesis now, moving towards the end of the year. What are you looking at? What kind of projects are exciting over at Coin Fund? Yeah, so again, I, I feel so lucky. I get I get to meet and interface with some of the most the brightest founders in the world. Um, we're still seeing a ton of global activity. Um, almost half of our investments are overseas. Uh, we're seeing incredible development. It's continuing, you know, across infrastructure. There's some some amazing gaming projects that are about to come out. I think we're expecting like um, 12 or so token generation events uh, coming out from projects that have been building. Um, like I, I talked about the ton ecosystem, very, very exciting space. I mean, look what just happened with Notcoin, um, you know, and, and, and other gaming projects that are, that are coming out there. Just the, the distribution associated with that, you know, essentially killer app is, is profound. Um, seeing some very interesting things in the deep, in the Deepin front, like Deepin hasn't really had its moment yet. Um, but gosh, some of these projects are, are delivering really amazing utility. So that's another very interesting vertical. Of course, we, we continue to look at other DeFi projects um, and, and some centralized projects. I think um, non-US dollar uh, stable coins are interesting. We're about to have Mika come into effect June 30th. So we're, we're looking across the globe, uh, across verticals. It's an exciting place to be. Uh, and we remain very excited about the long-term prospects of this industry. Any particular region that you're seeing, I guess, exponential growth or um, regulatory clarity coming faster than we have it in, in the States? I know that the Middle East is looking to create a few Web3 hubs. Hong Kong wants to be a Web3 hub. You mentioned gaming there. I know a lot of the gaming projects are coming up out of the Asian region. Any specific region that is exciting to you at the moment? You know, I think all of the regions have different levels of excitement. Um, and in, I also think the, the sleeping giants started to wake up here. Um, so I'm very, very bullish about, about the U.S., um, very bullish about the U.K. Uh, we met with the Economic Secretary of the Treasury not too long ago. He said, hey, bring your portfolio companies. We really want your help to understand how to be the best in the world. Um, and obviously, they're feeling pressure from the Europeans. And that, that's a very healthy amount of competition. Um, you can't you, you can't ignore the UAE, um, the, the building that's going on from a regulatory perspective, whether it's, it's the team in VARA or ADGM. Again, they're, they're trying to take a leadership role. They get it. They're trying to work with portfolio companies. Every time I go to, to Abu Dhabi, they say, you know, when are you moving here? We you know we want you to come here, bring your companies with you. This is all very healthy. And then, of course, Asia. Asia is always very exciting. Um, you know, Hong Kong is on the move and then that makes Singapore have to be on the move. So um, it, it's hard to isolate a single region. I do think that the U.S. is um, is quickly catching up as things start stabilizing and, and we start seeing clarity. Um, so you, you really can't fade the U.S. markets. Um, we're a giant. And I do think that this regulatory de-risking is going to be a very, very good unlock for the industry. Tell me a little bit more about that. I know that you're an advisor uh, to the CFTC. But we just finished consensus a few weeks ago. At consensus, SEC Commissioner Hester Peirce told me that she really doesn't think that people in Washington care that innovation is going 
overseas because they still don't really understand the technology and the opportunity that it brings. And many lawyers I've talked to have told me they are advising their clients to um, set up shop overseas in places where there is more regulatory clarity. Tell me a little bit more about your excitement and, and why you maybe see through some of those comments. Sure. So I am on the CFTC Global Markets Advisory Committee. They've asked for uh, insight and regulatory recommendations uh, for a few things. I've been tasked to look at NFTs uh, and also look at uh, things like utility tokens. So we're, we're working really closely. Uh, if anyone ever wants to you know, provide feedback on things that we should include, uh, please reach out to me. Uh, but it's been a very healthy dialogue. Um, we don't always agree on everything, but it's healthy. Um, the other thing that I'm really excited about, uh, we announced this recently at the CFTC, is that we they put out this uh, this recommendation that we should recognize ETFs as eligible collateral to the extent they have treasuries underneath them. And I piped up and said, "Well, I agree. We shouldn't have we should we shouldn't focus on the wrapper. We should focus on the underlying. Therefore, you know, tokenized treasury market uh, money market funds." these things should be used as collateral. And I think that that's going to be a big area of focus. So look, I know I'll tell you that the truth about the U S markets is that time is on our side. Um, why do we have some challenges? Uh, because we have a pretty old, uh, are many of the folks who, who govern our country right now are, are a little bit on the, they're, they're on the old side. It's very hard to convince them about nuances of new technology. Um, nature has a way of working itself out. Um, and that said, we're still seeing some of these very um, prominent congressmen coming around and embracing crypto because they're listening to their constituents. And so I feel, again, pretty good. Just look at what's happened in recent weeks. That trend's only going to continue and accelerate into the election. Um, and, it, and it sounds like, you know, both um, presidential candidates are now focusing on on reasonable crypto policy. All right. We'll have to wait and see if crypto comes up in the debate, that I believe, is next week. Now, Chris, we do this thing on the show where I ask our guests for their hottest take. It can be on anything, so I don't want to put you on the spot. It doesn't have to be a prediction. It can be a prediction. You can highlight a different area of the industry that you're really excited about, which I know you did throughout this interview. But what's your hottest take on the crypto markets right now? You're going to see a number of uh, new ETF applications uh, by the end of the year, and that will be with a number of different altcoins um, that currently have uh, futures listed in the U.S. Chris, thanks so much for joining me. It was a pleasure speaking to you this morning. Thanks, Jen. Always good to see you.